Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is indeed a day you have made, and we rejoice in it. We rejoice in it because we rejoice in you. You are our Creator. You are our Savior. You are our Redeemer. And we give you thanks and praise for all you have done for us. We give you thanks and praise for the fact that you have given us so many clues as to what things will be like when your Son returns to earth. We ask you, O Lord, now as we wrap up this particular series, we pray, O Lord, that we would take the things that you have shared with us to heart and we would keep watch. We would be ready for the day that Jesus comes. Be with us, O Lord, in these difficult times. We pray we would continue to rejoice in them no matter how difficult they get. Please, Father, Anoint my tongue to declare this word that you've given me today and anoint every ear that hears it to receive it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we read through many signs Jesus said would precede his coming. We were given an orderly account, a step-by-step outline of the things which are going to take place before Jesus returns. We were even told what day the Lord will return. Though we do not know the year, we know that Jesus will return on the Feast of Trumpets because the mysterious phrase, of that day and hour no one knows, is a Jewish idiom which points to the Feast of Trumpets. That huge and extremely important piece of information had been hidden from Christ's church for centuries. God didn't hide the information from us. The devil buried it. In his efforts to change signs and seasons, The enemy severed the relational ties the church had with its Jewish roots. By doing this, believers in Jesus became unaware of many of the truths we would have known had that not happened. Thankfully, God began to reconnect the church to its Jewish roots some years ago. And what the enemy had hoped we would never have known is coming to light. Now we know that since Jesus fulfilled the spring feasts of the Lord to perfection when he came the first time, we know that when he comes the next time, he's going to fulfill to perfection all of the fall feasts. The first of the fall feasts is the Feast of Trumpets. It is Rosh Hashanah, the head of the new year. It is followed by Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, and Yom Kippur is followed by the Feast of Tabernacles. God has always wanted to tabernacle with man. He had been tabernacling with Adam and Eve before their sin put an end to that. Now, however, since Jesus has reconciled man to God through his own precious blood, the way has been paved for God to once again tabernacle among us. That is the blessed time believers long for, The day God will dwell with us and us with him forever. That day is quickly approaching. Jesus gave us so very many signs to watch for, and so many of them are taking place throughout the earth. But the greatest sign of all is Israel. We need to watch Israel because Israel is God's timepiece. It is the fig tree nation. Since 1948, when Israel once again became a nation in the earth, Its branches have become tender. Its leaves have been put forth. Now as Israel turns 72 years old this year, the nations have not only witnessed its branches becoming tender and then those branches putting forth leaves, Israel is bearing abundant fruit in a land which was once rocky and barren. We are the generation who is going to see everything Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 24, coming to pass. The birth pangs of the earth are increasing in intensity and in frequency. The end of the age is upon us. Please know that we are not facing the end of the world. We are facing the end of an age because the Lord has promised that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth which will never be spoiled by sin and death. A new heaven and a new earth 
which will be enjoyed by all who have ever lived, who have placed their trust and hope in Jesus. These all have come under the safety of his blood. But before that happens, there is going to be a lot of trouble this planet and everyone on it will have to go through. Some of the trouble is the earth itself moaning and contracting under the weight of sin. Some of the trouble will be caused by the devil and those who serve him. This is the tribulation. The wrath the devil is pouring out upon the earth because he knows that his time is short. Some of the troubles we'll go through are God's judgments. Remember, the judgments of God are redemptive in nature. Yes, they can be hard to go through, but it is always for our good. God intends for his judgments to not only get our attention, his hope, his desire is that they will result in our turning away from all sin and wickedness, which is repentance, in order to live our lives in such a way that he can say to us when we breathe our final breath, well done. We turn now to the closing section of Matthew 24. We begin at verse 42, and Jesus' word to us is, watch. He says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. As we've learned, the phrase, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, is a Jewish idiom. It points to the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles. Though it most definitely points to the Feast of Tabernacles, we still do not know what year Jesus will come or what hour during the Feast of Trumpets he will come. We do know that he will not come until the last trump is sounded. The trouble we have is this. We have a hard time watching and waiting for anything. Our attention span has been reduced to fractions of seconds. Fractions of seconds. And Jesus spoke these words nearly 2,000 years ago. Many people gave up watching for Jesus a long time ago. Most people live under the assumption that Jesus won't be returning to earth in their lifetime. And so they live as though he's not going to return. This is a problem. Because having been lulled to sleep for so long, having not been watching for so long, it is really hard to wake people up to the fact that Jesus' return is actually very near now. The signs Jesus spoke of are, in fact, happening all around us. Now is not the time to sleep. Now is the time to wake up. Now is the time to watch. Listen to Jesus' words beginning with verse 43. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. We know that what Jesus states here is true. If we knew that a thief was going to break into our house at a specific time in order to rob us, we would watch and we'd do everything we could to prevent that from happening. But thieves do not operate that way. They don't broadcast the houses they are going to break into because if they did, they would be met with resistance. They don't want to be met with resistance. They want easy targets. Jesus spoke the word that we ought to be watching for his return nearly 2,000 years ago. And many people are simply not watching. This is a huge mistake. All who are not watching will be completely caught off guard and surprised by his appearing. Jesus' continued word to us today is this. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Watch and be ready, because we don't know exactly when he will come. We've got to expect the unexpected. With all of the signs Jesus gave us to watch for, signs which are taking place throughout the earth right now, we really don't have an excuse for our not watching and for our not being ready for his return. Jesus then turns his attention to those he would classify as faithful and wise servants. Beginning at verse 45, Jesus states, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, 
when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. People like to complicate things that are easy to understand. There are only two kinds of servants, the faithful and wise and the wicked. The faithful and wise do what they know to do even though their master is absent. Even if the master is gone for an extended period of time, they go about their master's business because they belong to the master and he expects them to do the work he has given them to do. We might think that being a servant is a menial job. But the servant Jesus speaks of, of here is the ruler over, the ruler over the master's household. Being made ruler over the master's household means that the master has a certain degree of trust that the servant will do the work the master requires of him or her. Had the master not thought that the servant could do what he wanted him to do, he would not have made him ruler of his household. Being made ruler of the master's household wasn't a position given to the servant the first day the servant came to serve the master's household. The master would have watched the servant for a period of time to see what skills and abilities the servant had. The master would have watched how the servant treated the other servants who belonged to the master's household. Only after a period of time would the master make the servant ruler of his household. In this particular passage, the servant, the ruler of the master's household, was expected to give the members of the master's household the food they needed when they needed it. The members of the master's household were not to go hungry. It didn't matter how long the master was going to be gone. The servant was to do this work faithfully and consistently. So long as the servant did this, when the master returns home, he will praise the servant, bless the servant, and make him ruler over all of his goods. But if the servant doesn't do what he knows he is to do, for whatever reason, but especially because he sees that the master is slow in returning home, he will not be ready for the master to return when his master does come home. The actions of the master toward that evil servant will not be good. Jesus makes it clear. The master, when he returns to find the servant he'd made ruler over his household, not doing what the servant knew to do, will cut the servant in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is not a pretty picture, is it? Jesus, our master, has been gone a very long time. We are his servants if we believe in him and trust him for life and salvation. Are we doing the work he instructed us to do before he left earth to return to his father? I'm sure some of Jesus' servants are. I'm also sure that some of Jesus' servants aren't. The judgment of who is doing the work of the master and who isn't doing the work of the master isn't ours to make. That judgment belongs solely to the master. Our task is to be doing the work our master has given us to do. Now if we claim we do not know what work our master Jesus would have us do, then all we need to do is search God's word for it. The work we are to do isn't hard to find. It's right there in the text of the scriptures. Now I do understand that God can certainly give some people specific assignments. He does that all the time. But much of the work our master gives us is covered within the Bible, generally covered. It, it's really for everyone to do. Our work, 
begins with the command to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. That command is quickly followed by our being commanded to love our neighbor as ourselves. The command to love will keep us from being like the wicked servant in the passage I read from Matthew 24, who beat his fellow servants and who caroused with drunkards. Let's consider further the command to love our neighbor as ourselves. What does that look like? Jesus gives us that answer in Matthew 25, beginning at verse 31. There we read, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. When we minister to, when we love the least of these, as Jesus calls them in Matthew chapter 25, he receives what we do as our doing these things to him. This is what love looks like, doing things for the least. The goats, I didn't read that section, but the goats ignored the plight of the least of these. And so they were condemned. Let's look at another command. Before Jesus went to be with the Father, he commanded his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, them meaning every new disciple, to observe or obey everything Jesus had taught them. That one command covers everything Jesus said, and the things Jesus said we are to teach are recorded for us in the the Gospels. The command to baptize is followed by the command to disciple all nations. That is, we are to disciple all ethnic groups. No ethnic group is to be left out. Now, let's not make discipling other people difficult. It can be as simple as walking beside another person and talking with them about Jesus, explaining what Jesus taught, or our being an example of what he taught. Everybody can do this. If we don't know what Jesus taught, then please, let's get into the Word of God and learn these truths for ourselves and then do them. We need to be about our Master's business. He's returning soon. It is time we awake from whatever level of sleep we may be in. Rub the sleep from our eyes. Watch and be ready. That is my prayer that we would wake from our slumber, that we would be ready, that we would be watching, that we would be doing the things our Heavenly Father has given us to do. This is my prayer. I hope it is your prayer. Amen.